the Collect Challenge presentation. So hi everybody, welcome to the Developer User Group. My name is Candice. I'm surrounded by co-hosts tonight. <laughs> we have Ezra, Joshua, we have Robert. Um, I feel like there's somebody else. Where are they? Is that all from us on the user group tonight? I think Matt was in and then out. He'll be back. Okay, no, that's fine. So Matt's not part of the co-organizing committee. So thank you co-organizers for arriving tonight to support me because Zoom intimidates me terribly. Um, but lovely to welcome you all to our user group. We meet at this time, six o'clock every third Wednesday of the month. And we hope to bring great topics uh, that are suitable for a developer audience and even people who aren't developers, but just are interested in the landscape. So tonight we have some great talks, actually. The Intellect Challenge is an annual challenge um, which has gained a lot of popularity over the last few years. And I think uh, thanks to Intellect, every year we've had somebody come to talk to us about it. Tonight we're actually meeting the team that puts a lot of the plumbing together to make that challenge happen. So that's uh, Jana and James. James, I'm not sure if you're a, a developer, but I know, Jana, you are an intermediate developer. Yes, I'm also, also an intermediate developer. Okay, because your profile tells me you just say random things and make noises and fall off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good summary of myself, yeah. So I'm hoping I'll, I'll leave your introductions to both of you as you start your presentation, but very excited to hear about some of the great work that you're doing to make this challenge happen for us every year. So are you two both ready to go? Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, great. So um, when your presentation's done, we'll be welcoming Matt and John. Uh, all the way from the UK. So um, we'll we'll do that introduction as soon as your talk is done. I have a prize, a uh, JetBrains license, which James, you and Yana can give away at the end of your talk to whoever you feel has maybe asked you the most creative question or engaged with you in a way that uh, makes your heart sing. So you can be the deciders of who to give that prize away to. So over to you both. Perfect. Thanks so much for the great introduction, Candice. I really appreciate it. So I'm James. Um, my colleague is Jana, and uh, we're both intermediate software software engineers at Intellect. Um, I've been working in the challenge for this is my third year now. Um, this is I think Jana. This is your, this is Jana's second year in the challenge. Yep. Um, and so yeah, so we're part of the game engine team. Um, in the Intellect Challenge team, so we've got multiple different facets in the team, and we're here to talk to you a little bit about the Intellect Challenge and uh, what it is, what we do here. Um, so this year, the game we're putting forward, the challenge we're putting forward, we're titled as titled Galaxio. Uh, and before we dive too deep into it, we're going to start kick things off with a little video, a little video trailer about it. Cool. So what is the Intellect Challenge? Um, the Intellect Challenge is an annual coding competition that we run. Um, it is, in essence, you build a bot, uh, an AI bot, to play the game on your behalf. And by doing so, you stand a chance to win great prizes. Uh, this is our 10th anniversary challenge. So uh, the 10th time the challenge has been run, you have the opportunity to win up to 200,000 Rand in prizes. Typically, it's based on a classic or retro game. This year, because it's our 10th anniversary, we've decided to do something a little bit different, come up with a game of our own, more than based on something that already exists, and um, just try to sort of you know, raise the bar a little bit, do something a little bit extra. The, the main aim of the challenge, it started out as almost a sort of a recruitment drive, but uh, it's actually morphed into a great community community interaction initiative where really we just want to come together with, and do something cool with our community in the dev space. Uh, we also run the University Cup. This will be our fourth time running the University Cup, and it's actually how I first got involved with the challenge. Um, and what we do there is it's a one-day hackathon. 
we go to the universities, we put out a challenge, we give them a problem statement, much like Google hash code, if you've participated in that, um, and they compete amongst themselves in, in little teams and the best, the best uh, team wins a bunch of great prizes. So this year, what is the theme? So this year, we've put together a little space flight based battle royale game where you are, your bot will be in control of a uh, spaceship and you'll navigate around the map um, to consume planetary bodies and consume your foes, absorbing their energies. And this allows you to grow. You compete to be the largest and when you're the largest, you win. So a couple of the core mechanics in our game, we've got standard, some, some movement mechanics, which are quite important because this year is the first we've done a continuous Cartesian plane. So you can go anywhere you like in this game. So that to facilitate this, we have a forward movement, which you provide the engine with the command of going forward with a heading, and that will start you moving in that direction. Obviously, then you need a way to, to lift your key, your finger off the key. And so we have the stop command as well. And then we also have the afterburner command, because as I said, you need to grow. And so we have an interesting mechanic is the fast, the bigger you are, the slower you move, the smaller you are, the faster you move. So to give the bigger players a better chance of catching up to smaller, smaller foes, they have an afterburner, which you can toggle on to double your speed at a trade of losing size every, every time the game engine ticks over. A couple of the obstacles and things that can be found around the map when your bot is playing is asteroid fields. These are complicated places to navigate, and so you have to move slower through them than you normally would. Gas clouds, which slowly sap off your energy of your bot, making it smaller. You've got little food, or little planetary bodies around the map, which you can consume, as I said, to get larger. And you also have wormholes to that you allow you to navigate around the map nice and effectively. There are more of these obstacles and different mechanics coming as we go through each one of the tournaments. Jan will explain what those are a little bit later. Um, and as we go through those tournaments, we add more and more to the to the game every, during those times so that you can keep improving your bot, keep playing better and try out new things as well. So then um, I just want to quickly talk about in terms of how this was actually done. And um, like I said, for the 10th anniversary, we wanted to do something special. So typically we had anywhere from two to four players in any given match. And our, our previous challenges were turn-based. So the engine would tell all the bots what the map looked like in one, in one round, waited for all of them to tell them what their um, command was and once it had all the commands from the bots, it would then go and compute the next round. You can think of it almost like chess. This year, we decided we wanted to go big or go home. So like I said, it's Battle Royale. We want to put a lot of players all together, and that means multiplayer. So in a tournament, you'll play between seven to nine bots, depending on how many total submissions we have. Um, and this is all done so the engine can sit and tick away and continue to play the game and then recompute the state of the world constantly, but with um, allowing the bots to provide their commands and how, what they want to do in the game at any point, point during the game as well. So you don't have to wait for the engine. You just send a command, much like a real game you, would, you or I as us normal humans would play. Um, this is, a, like I said, a multiplayer game. And how we facilitated that was by using a uh, real-time communication framework called Signal R that's baked into csharp.net. Um, and this is a WebSocket implementation and allows us to connect up to as many bots as we want and communicate to all of them fairly and effectively across the whole range of it. One of the other main drivers we had for implementing this, um, the, implementing it in this way was we actually decoupled a lot of our core components and used Signal Art to communicate between them as well. And a primary decision there was in previous years, we had um, we had to implement the engine in a JVM based language and we wanted to remove that limitation. So whoever came next, whoever decided, whoever wanted to be part of the team and implement, if they wanted to bring something cool or some new cool language or some new cool framework, they could bring that to the table and we wouldn't be bound to the JVM. We can implement it in any language that understands web sockets, which at this point in the world of the web is most of them. So I'm going to hand over to Jana. She's going to talk a little bit more about some of the other cool stuff we're doing on the engine and how you can get started. Hi everyone, uh, it's very nice to speak with all of you. So I'm going to start with our procedural generation. So we uh, generate all the objects on our map um, and we use different procedural generations to place these objects on our map. So we have two main structures. So firstly, for our food and wormhole objects, um, we use a tree-based generation structure, starting with some star points and placing 
each of the nodes um, in order uh, based on certain parameters and then um, deciding if those placements are valid and continuing so on. This allows us to create a more um, organic feeling to the placements of these objects around the map, um, which is important as we don't want to uh, base it too heavily on any side. Uh, the second one we have for gas clouds and asteroid fields, um, we used a reductive node generation strategy. So we place multiple circles in a certain zone and then reduce these circles until we form these organic cloud-like shapes, um, which simulate the areas that the bots move through for these. So both of these methods use seeds to allow for perfect repeatability of the map. Um, but can't be predicted ahead of time without knowledge of the seeds. As, as we generate objects, each object we place, we uh, change the seed dynamically. So it's very hard to reverse engineer. We did this to encourage the community to focus on true AI strategies rather than search and pathfinding algorithms, which were quite popular last year. We also need the perfect re repeatability in case we need to replay map. Um, maps um, and we don't want to unfairly advantage a certain player if we need to do that. So um, we also made quite a large change to our infrastructure this year. We actually migrated from Azure to AWS completely. Um, so I'm just going to touch on some of the big components of our new infrastructure. So firstly, our entire infrastructure is source controlled through GitLab. We also use Terraform as an infrastructure as code platform, as this provides us with the ability to provision our infrastructure consistently and quickly. Under the hood, everything is powered with AWS from our website hosting to our serverless APIs and all of our workflow uh, up, um, orchestration as well. We have chosen a serverless approach in AWS to minimize the cost and also to be able to scale uh, according to the um, load that we need to handle. And then finally, we use Docker to run all our contestant bots and our game orchestrators. So in a bit more of a granular view, I'm just gonna to touch on each of these lightly. So firstly, we have our Lambdas. Um, Lambda, which is a serverless compute service. So that runs our backend for us. This also enables us to scale our backend instantly to accommodate any size of load on our system. ECR is where we store all the player submission in Dockerize forms. This allows us to pull the submission directly into any match. Then we have Fargate on ECS. Fargate uh, on ECS is a Docker orchestration platform we use to play matches. ECS is really key this year as we have battle royale mode. And this allows us to start up to 128 bots at a time, each with eight gigabytes of RAM and four vCPUs per bot. Uh, each of these ECS clusters is created dy dynamically before the match is started to ensure isolation between matches as well as increase security between matches. And then it's terminated after each match is completed to not waste any resources. Then we have our DynamoDB. This is the database that stores all of our data for the intellect challenge. DynamoDB also uh, provides us with single digit millisecond performance at any scale, which is important when we're running our uh, matches. Um, we also have the event bridge, which is a serverless event bus that enables us to decouple our event-driven backend um, at scale. Uh, we have our SQS. Uh, this is a messaging queue service, which enables us to decouple our backend from our in-house built match orchestration service. Um, this queue allows us to schedule over a thousand matches at once and manage how many of those matches are played at any time. We can also toggle the queue receiver on and off, um, allowing us to stop playing matches, but without disrupting the matches that we are queuing at the back. We can also toggle this back on without any disruption to the current um, matches and continue as nothing happened. Um, we then have our S3 bucket where we store all of our logs that are produced during the intellect challenge matches. S3 also scales with the rest of our services, and that enables us to store the multiple gigabyte logs that we produce during the large single um, EC matches uh, within seconds after the, the match is completed. And finally, we have SES, which is used to send emails to all our players about their submissions and also keep them updated with all the player communications. So now I'm gonna quickly touch on how to get started with Intellect Challenge. So, um, Firstly, you have to visit our website and register as a player. Um, we will post links at the end of this chat to all of these, so don't worry. Um, once you've registered, you can head to the link displayed above 
called GitHub registration. So this will take you through the steps I'm going through now, um, but in more detail and um, gives you all the like tips and tricks that you could get stuck on. So firstly, oh, sorry. Firstly, you're gonna want to uh, install Git and set your name and config in the um, name and email in the Git config. Uh, you want to solve this on your local machine so that you have this up and running for the rest of the, the innate process. Um, then you're going to want to create a private GitHub repository for your bot. Once you've done that, you're going to want to create, generate and enter two GitHub secrets. Um, this is also explained in more detail on the GitHub registration page if you're not familiar with this process. Once this is done, you can clone the private repository you created to your local machine and download our starter pack. So our starter pack contains um, basic bots in our five uh, supported languages currently. These languages are C++, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, and um, Python. So you can choose to compete in any of these languages during the tournaments. Um, and we supply a basic starter bot for people to start tinkering with. Um, once you have the starter bot, you can download the CICD file for the language you have chosen to compete in. And then finally, you can make your first commit and push a bot. I recommend you don't do any significant changes in your first commit, just to make sure that your upload flow is working correctly. Um, also, if you have any issues at any stage, we do have a forum that we support and you can post there and we will help you through any uh, bugs or issues you encounter. So, how the tournaments work. So we have three open tournaments each year. This year, Pulse at Kick, Nova, and Supernova. So during these, you can submit as many times as you want. Um, once we hit the end date, shown in yellow, we will close submissions and then run a tournament with all the valid bots submitted in that round. During the tournament, bots get ranked based on how they perform in the tournament against other bots. And the end, we have a ranking on which we award prizes, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so you don't have to enter all three bots to be able to stand a chance to qualify for our final Hype Nova, uh, which we uh, are gonna have at Comic-Con Africa at the end of this year. Um, the top eight players from the three uh, will be able to compete in Hype Nova, but like I said, you can submit in one tournament, you can submit in all three, but you have to qualify to get to Hype Nova. So the prizes for these tournaments are as follow. First and second tournament, um, first bot gets a golden ticket. Golden ticket means that you instantly qualify as one of the eight bots to compete in the final. And that means a guaranteed prize of 10,000. If you don't make golden ticket in the first two rounds, you still have a chance to win um, 2,000, 1,000 rounds respectively for second and third. The third tournament, the top six bots will all get a golden ticket to the final at Comic-Con. And then the final, we have our prizes. So all eight players will win a guaranteed 10,000. First prize, of course, walks away with a lot more with a max prize of 70,000 Rand. So hopefully that's enough motivation to get involved. So finally, I just wanna say thank you to the team members who make this possible each year. It's a completely voluntary uh, program that oh, project that we run. So all this is done in our free time and uh, extra hours and lots of late nights. So just a quick thank you to all the squads that take part. So we've got our cloud squad, we've got our game engine team, our university cup team, our website and design team, and then finally our project management team. Thank you all for giving us a chance to chat. And then uh, here's the uh, places you can contact us up. We'll put it in the chat as well. And now opening the floor to any questions that there might be. Thank you. That was a very polished presentation. You managed to say a lot in such a short space of time. Well done. Gosh, this challenge has really evolved over the years. It is so sophisticated. You guys it's have really, done such an incredible job. Thanks. I really appreciate that. I mean, I think what's really awesome for us is that I think not only externally have we grown, but also internally as well. As the, the team, I think is it's a lot bigger. Um, last year it, it started to grow. This year it's it's really in a quite a big size, and it's it's been it's been a lot of fun. 
And what an amazing thing to have so many people volunteer to be part of this. You know, it's not your day job. Don't get paid for it. It's just out of the sheer love and passion for it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's incredible. Has anyone got a yeah. hand up? I can't really see on my side if there are hands up. I'm not Maybe seeing any know. hands. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands just yet. If, any, if ever anyone wants to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand and then we can unmute you so that you can ask your question. Um, other than that, you can also post in the chat and we will read it out. Yeah, so I'm seeing those links. Thank you, Nadine, for sharing the links. Um, hopefully, those of you that are not following Intellect on Twitter, you'll follow now because you'll get lots of feedback and lots of news about the challenge. Um, I see a new message. Oh, pleasure. <laughs> oh, um, Bruce is saying he's experiencing no sound. This is weird, but I'm going to ask out loud. Is anybody else having that problem? I can hear you quite well. Um, okay. I'm not sure. Yeah, I can, I can also hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, all right, thank you for the feedback from Victor and Faith. That gives me confidence that it's not just the co-hosts and the presenters that can hear one another. <laughs> um, unfortunately, Mbuso, hopefully we'll, I'll drop a message in the chat, hopefully we'll reconnect um, and have a better experience. Okay, there's a question from somebody called Clock. For a beginner with experience with just Python and Java, what advice would you give? Yeah, so um, for the beginners, uh, right on the website, we we release a starter pack um, for every for every tournament. Before every tournament, um, there's a starter pack, and in that starter pack, all of the languages that we support out the box, um, we have a starter bot for that language in there. It, it's not a very complicated bot; it doesn't do much, um, but it'll get you up and running. It'll get you connected and being able to play the game. You can submit it outright and. Um, That'll give you everything you need to get started and get competing. From there, if there was uh, any uh, like hints or tips I would I could give, it was it's that um, uh, testing really. Uh, just keep keep submitting and keep keep seeing how how your bot does over time. Um, the the I think a lot of a lot of our previous challenges and the guys who who return every year. One of the, the trends I've noticed is they spend a lot of time analyzing the logs that they get out of a match. Um, I think a lot more than I, even when I, I'm building this, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't spend that much time on the logs. They spend a lot more than I do. <laughs> yeah, I think another good tip um, is don't get bogged down trying to do everything. Start with a very simple strategy, get a base bot, submit that, and then build from there. You don't have to build Grome in a day. You can start small, and there is an entire year to improve your bot. But sometimes simple strategies actually win over, over complicated um, strategies, because sometimes those bots kind of get confused and just stop functioning properly. Just checking if anybody else has a question or a comment. Okay, I'm not seeing anything new. So um, Jana and James, it's up to you if you would like to give the um, prize. I see Josh did ask, ask a question uh, as well, uh, just in terms of investigating the logs. So this year the logs are quite complicated and, and big um, just purely because of the size of the game as well so what we've done is we've actually gone with a visualizer as well so you'll find in the starter pack there is already a visualizer that you can pull down and you can you can feed it your logs and you get a full you get a full picture of what is actually going on um, in that match and actually what's happening there yeah um yeah. Candice, on, on your question, I'm not sure if, if maybe the next set of presenters would prefer handing out handing out the, the license. Or... I have two for them. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, then I think they I think Clocks, Clocks gets it then, I think. Yeah. Okay, great. Well done, Clocks, on winning that prize. If you can drop me a direct message with your email address, we'll send that off to you. Yana, James, thank you so much and all the best Pleasure. for the challenge. I'm sure it's going to be a hit again. Awesome. Thank thanks, and thanks so much for hosting us. Of course. Welcome back anytime. We'd love to hear more from you. Thanks. And let us know who wins. Oh, definitely. You'll definitely see that on the website. Everywhere. <laughs> Hopefully it's one of you. 
because you've got the advantage now. You've got all the tips and tricks ahead of the others. Okay, great. So um, as I said earlier, we're welcoming two speakers from the United Kingdom tonight, which is very exciting. Um, some of you already know our good friend Matt, who is no stranger to the user group, has presented many times, um, especially when he was in some of the thick of, uh, what is it, the Revenge of the Llamas or Vicious Attack of the Llama Apocalypse. Uh, That's exactly the name, well done. I had to read that. I could never remember what it's called. I just know that the graphics are amazing. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I mean, the only thing I ever managed to do uh, was build a hat for a UNISA assignment that was three-dimensional in C++. So, I mean, that took me three weeks. <laughs> I can't imagine the effort it takes to build games. Um, so Matt's relocated to the UK and he's working for a great company called Rare. Uh, John Bradshaw is his colleague, also a, a lead developer there um, at Rare, and I'm looking forward to welcoming you, John, for the first time to the user group Thank tonight. you, thank you. It's going to be great to hear from both of you about the Sea of Data, aptly named since you're developing a game called Sea of Thieves. Um, and so um, what, I'm, what I'm understanding from your description there is it's about how you've migrated many things to the cloud and got it to work in a way that didn't interrupt your users. So I hope I've more or less summarized it, but over to you both to uh, let us know who you are, what you're about, and what you want to share with us tonight. Cool. Um, yeah, so I am Matt. Uh, I started working at Rare about, I think, two years ago. Um, I'm a senior services engineer there, and John is my boss, who does? Yeah, I've been around about eight and a half years now, somewhere on that order. Um, I hired this guy below. Um, we do cool shit together, uh, a bit of a dream team, I'm sure. Uh, so, you know, we're going to give you a rundown on uh, migrating ship tons of data and uh, Hopefully, a little insight. Cool. So, um, I assume everyone can see my screen. Um, yep. Yeah. So, we are from a company called Rare. Uh, we've made games, well, Rare has made games like Perfect Dark, Viva Pinata, and Battletoads. The specific game we're talking about today is Sea of Thieves. Now, Sea of Thieves is Rare's first service-based title, and it's one of these games that just continually evolves. It's been out for three years now, and we've got uh, over 20 million players now. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of data there. So we run the services that keep the game online, and over time, the load is increasing, and we're starting to struggle to scale our services correctly for the just massive amounts of players and data that we have to deal with. Uh, also, it's a very expensive game to run, so saving some money would be good. Now, specifically, what we're talking about today is a, a service that's called emblem now in the game every time you do something uh you can get a commendation uh, or a stat towards a commendation and we store all of that we also have no eviction policy so if a pirate comes back after four years we will still have their their same data and as we go on you know we're three years later now um as we go on, we're slowly reaching like an absolute cap of how much we can store and how big we can scale to. So this is where our migration to Cosmos comes in. Uh, Microsoft has a database called Cosmos. John's going to explain that. But basically, we want to move all of that data across into, into Cosmos. So this talk is basically just a casual talk uh going through our thought processes there and stuff john cool cheers matt yeah uh, as matt so alluded to there we have this service called emblem uh, as matt said they're showing games with these things you call accommodations uh 
you can think of commendations as kind of like an objective. So uh, if you're playing a game, you're trying to kill a skeleton, sail a certain distance, do various other game activities, the game basically fires a statistic or stat ID. So the player did this one thing, an event basically, that makes its way through our various messaging buses and back end infrastructure, hits this emblem service, and we kind of basically record that, hey, player X gained plus one stat towards this particular accommodation. And when you hit a given threshold, we will give you a reward, gold, uh, maybe a costume, a hat, who knows, right? Um, but that does mean for, for every single accommodation, and they may, each accommodation may require one or more stats to complete it, we're tracking your progress. So that is a lot of data, and it's a lot of data that comes in very fast as well. Yes, you can imagine that those events happening n times a second, scaled by uh, the hundreds of thousand players, that happens really quick. So um, we sort of picked Redis way back when in 2015, uh, yeah, because this game's been in development obviously long before it launched, um, mainly for its performance, right? Because as you know, or hopefully for those who don't, Redis is basically a in memory key value or key slash collection store, right? So therefore, by that's very nature, it's very fast. Uh, and that's kind of our reason for picking it originally was kind of like we, we knew we we're gonna have this very aggressive uh, data arrival rate, this ingestion. So we thought, let's let's just pick the fastest thing we can that's available right now and go with that. Um, benefit for us at that time, uh, Redis was offered as a kind of a managed Azure offering. So we didn't have to go and grab our own VMs and install Redis. You could sort of go, hey, Azure, I would like a Redis cluster of a I don't know, 120 gig size node. And I'd like five of them, please. Um, and it's, it served as well for, for <laughs> the longest period of time. Um, but the game has been phenomenally successful. And we are sort of seeing the, the the end of the line in terms of scalability. Uh, so as you can see right now, we are these are kind of the, the current size cache instances that Azure offers. We're currently already using the top tier, these 120 gigabyte instances, of which we are currently scaled to this seven of them in a, in a sharded cluster. Um, and the maximum you can have in a cluster without having to say, write to Azure support and say, hey, by the way, I've designed my app badly. I need to scale beyond what you allow me to um, <laughs> is 10, right? And we're at 7 out of 10. So yeah, we are, we are literally at 70% capacity. Um, the game still is fairly young. And so we kind of keep, that said, we keep that data around forever. We don't want to kind of rule out anybody ever coming back or taking a break. So yeah, when we release new content, we'd like to see people come back and have their data there for them. And I guess, obviously, as we lead to when it comes to the cost perspective, these things keep data in memory and memory is not the cheapest cloud resource. Um, so this just gives you an idea of how much that cluster cost us over a month. Um, we're lucky that our game's got a reasonable budget, but either way, we still have to be careful with our spending, right? Um, so then that kind of brings on to Cosmos, right? So how we're going to solve the problem, where do we want to go? Cosmos is sort of, Azure's kind of fun of better cloud native um, world slash Cosmos scale document database. Um, it's sort of um, unlike, unlike Redis, where you sort of keep everything in RAM all the time, therefore you have the full pumps available all the time, but also you're paying for the storage all the time. Um, the biggest benefit is how Cosmos is sort of priced and scaled, right? So in Cosmos, you pay for how much data throughput you want, basically how many transactions a second, which they call uh, RU units. And then you also pay for your storage as kind of separate cost, right? So those players who aren't playing, we're just paying the storage cost for them rather than paying for the, the request units, which for, for users that basically aren't playing. So we can only, we only pay for the transactions per second for those who are actually playing the game. Uh, these are measuring what they call RUs. So RU units kind of vary. So uh, off the top of my head, like a single database read might cost one and a half RUs, depending on how much data you return. An update might cost you three RUs, or maybe in our case, you've got data spread across multiple regions because Cosmos is geo distributed as well. You can say, I'd like data in two regions. If it only costs you three, then now it'll cost you six RUs to write to two regions. Um, so they're kind of our big two motivating factors. Uh, again, Cosmos wasn't a thing that it even remotely existed back when we started this project. Like I think Azure Document DB was kind of just on the scene. Um, so we kind of adopted this. It's kind of scalability wise, there's no kind of like capping out at 
10 shards because I keep going forever in theory. Um, and as a bonus, you know, we also get to reduce our cost along the way. I don't think I've forgotten to them about, have I? That's in a nutshell. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I'll let Matt just run you through kind of the the problems with actually how we get from A to B. How do we get from Redis to Cosmos? Because yeah, there's no simple push button migrate for this. Uh, so I'll let Matt run through the the challenges we face here. Yeah. So it sounds like an easy an easy problem. You just copy a database um, or read from one and write to the other. The problem is that Sea of Thieves is a live service game. So we have lots of players constantly changing data. And our goal is to have no downtime except for around a two hour update window, uh, which is around once a month. So that gives us basically two hours to migrate the data, test that all the data is actually there, uh, and deploy any of the new services or, or everything um, that we need to do which is not a lot of time, especially when you have billions of items to, to migrate. Another very important thing is that we absolutely can't impact the player experience. So a player should just never know that any of this, this happened. Um, when, when the game comes back after the, the update window, things just need to work. Uh, and obviously we absolutely can't lose any data. So when we started to investigate this, uh, we spun up a very big Azure VM and we wrote a, a little app. Now, what we quickly realized was that reading from the Redis service has a ton of overhead. Um, not so much when you're doing individual calls, like the way a service um, or an API would use Redis, but I mean, we're reading billions. So that's a ton of overhead. The solution we came up with there is instead we download the backups, which we create every four hours or so on Redis. Um, we, we download a backup set, we pass through it, which we can do because the Redis backup format is fairly well documented. Uh, we pass through that data and then we send that, that up to Cosmos. Another thing to note is that in Redis, we use the message pack format and in Cosmos, it's expanded like normal JSON. Uh, so the app also does that. The, the picture over here is showing us testing this process on a single shard. Uh, so one of the backup files. Um, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but John, can you see my cursor? Okay, you're wiggling it. Yeah. So uh, the green lines over here show that when we first started, we very quickly hit our, our scale limits in, in Cosmos, uh, or like how much we had scaled our Cosmos capacity to. Uh, and then we slowed it down and ran the, the rest of the file. So there were 10 million throttled requests uh, when we were just sending data too fast and 502 uh, million successful requests. So after playing with the scale numbers in Cosmos, the number we eventually came up with was we could set it to 1 million RUs and it would take three full days. Um, so if you look down here, that's on the 8th of March at around 10 a.m. We cleared all the data. We started the process again with Cosmos this time set to 1 million RUs, which is an obscene number, by the way. Uh, we then just let it write as fast as it could. Uh, you can see on, on the left here that our, our consumption of RUs was basically maxing out uh, how, like the throughput of Cosmos. Uh, and yeah, basically it took three days to get our data in there. Now I've done some math and 72 hours or three days is bigger than the two hour period in which we have to move this data. Also, um, this is what our cost summary was for three days, and it cost $16,000 uh, to simply test migrating that data, which isn't ideal. Um, it, uh, it's not just $16,000, though. It is uh, 
we've got two regions here. We've got EU North and EU West, and both of them uh, cost $8,000. Anyway, quite a lot. Uh, and luckily, you can't set Cosmos scale above a million without contacting support, else we might have cost a bit more than this. Um, so this is the screen where you can set up multiple regions. It's super easy. Uh, you just enable it and you add regions. Cosmos is pretty cool. It also doubles your cost and well multiplies it for, for every region. So uh, you have to be a little bit careful there. Now, uh, the actual data, I thought this was quite interesting. Um, this is the Azure overview page for our Redis database. And you can see here the seven shards that John talked about. Each one is using about 96 gigabytes of memory. Uh, the graph above that has a single line, but that's just because the data is spread over them quite evenly. So that's actually got seven lines over each other. And um, in total, that's 672 gigabytes of data. When we convert it from message pack into expanded JSON, it goes to 3.2 terabytes. So in Cosmos, we need to store 4.8 times more data. Uh, in total, the, the data we migrated in the, over those three days uh, was 3.4 billion records. It used 3.2 terab terabits, I can't remember, TRBs, <laughs> TB bytes. It used 3.2 TB bytes of data and hilariously, the index alone was 384 gigabytes. So uh, we have uh, we have managed to turn our RUs down. We've worked out uh, a reasonable number that we can run it at once we have all the data in. Uh, and we've got that set to 148,000 RUs. So now there's the time problem. As we worked out earlier, 72 hours is more than two hours. So, in this next slide, I have done my absolute best to take a very simple concept of incremental backups and make it look very complicated so that we look smart. Um, so, this is a super beautiful picture, and I'm going to run you through kind of our running theory on how we are going to do this migration. I don't know if either of us uh, mentioned this, but we haven't actually done this yet. We've, uh, we've been running the data side by side, but we haven't done the actual final migration. If, the, if you hear the Sea of Thieves has completely broken in a few weeks or months, <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, so time goes forward, as you know. So on the left here, um, we start at a theoretical time of 9 a.m. Time goes forward and people do things in the game. Uh, lots of data is changing, et cetera. And that data is uh, represented by the green block here. Now, when it gets to 10 AM, our automatic Redis backup happens. As soon as that happens, we use our, our VM to download that backup set. Now, it's important to note that that backup we just took is not an incremental backup it will be seven backup files and every one is a full set of data from that shard. So uh, whatever it was, 750 gigabytes, that's, that's basically the backup set that we download to the VM at that stage. Then in our fancy app, we parse through that data and we take all of it and we upload it to Cosmos. But at a previous point in time, we had saved sort of a meta value of the last change, um, the last like date time of the last value we looked at. So let's say it's, um, it's 10 a.m. now. This data basically goes from whenever to 10 a.m. We store the value of 10 a.m. And then the next time we take a backup, which now is at 12 a.m., goes into the fancy app. We can read, we can pass through that data and we can basically ignore any data that's before that, that marker. So anything 
that's green over here, we can now ignore. Anything that's red, we save to Cosmos. So after the first backup period, um, or after a few of them, we will be only a few hours behind the, the latest live data. And we can run this Cosmos database doing this for however long we want, side by side with the main game and with alongside the, the actual Redis database. So then we get to our update window. So 2 p.m., we take the game down, and we know it's going to be down for two hours. So then we do exactly the, the same process as before. We download the backup, but now players are no longer, uh, you know, then no one's playing the game anymore, so they're not changing anything. So we download that latest set of backup, um, latest set of backups. We put it through our app. We, uh, we take the delta of like all the values that have changed in the yellow time period, save it to Cosmos, and that's the migration step over here in the maintenance window. We then uh, will have a new set of services that will be backed by Cosmos instead of Redis. We'll deploy those out, and then we need to make sure all the data is there, and we need to test that, um, that the game works, the service is connecting correctly, and yeah, that we haven't broken anything. Now, a nice thing with doing it like this is that we can fall back easily. If, if we get to any step in this process, we can just say, no, this isn't working. Just leave the Redis, um, the Redis setup going. Even if we deploy our new services and find that something isn't working, uh, we can just deploy the old ones back in. Also, we can test side by side with different environments to, to make sure before even this maintenance window, to make sure that um, the Cosmos database that we've been writing historical data to just works perfectly. Uh, so assuming all of that works and we didn't break everything, at 3 p.m. we can ship the new build and everything goes live. And theoretically, players have no idea that anything ever changed. Now, as I said, right now we can run our Cosmos database side by side with our real Redis database. Um, and what's quite nice is that we can figure out how many RUs we need and how much it's going to cost us in future, et cetera. And that's for this database of $17,000, which if you remember is smaller than the $29,000 of Redis. So we would have achieved the scale thing and like we can scale much better now. And it's also much cheaper, even though we're storing 4.8 times as much data. So that was a lot of talking. Um, I think that's everything. So. If there are any questions. Actually, the observer people, nice one being Matt, got the same headsets, just saying. Oh yeah, we match. We've got the same accents too. I don't even <laughs> tell the difference between us. I say words like what now? I talk about Brian all the time. Yeah. Matt, is that a short sleeve shirt? It is a short sleeve shirt. <laughs> this is actually our new game called hey, Everwild. Everwild. I think we've announced it. <laughs> cool. So there's some stuff in the chat. Um, Somebody bought Sea of Thieves for $15, hoping that's going to contribute towards your migration costs. It, it does, actually. If you go back to this slide, <laughs> you, you can see that if you cover up all the numbers after the 17, that's almost our whole cost there. Oh, my gosh. Uh, do you think these costs will flatten out? That forecast graph is quite scary. No. so. Um, assuming you're talking about this graph here, this will not flatten out. This is going to be using exactly the same. Um, and yeah, by the end of the month, this forecast should be exactly right. So, so our ongoing cost for this database, uh, would be seventeen and a half thousand dollars. Um, sorry. Per month. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, per month. And, just reset. Uh, and also it's once again right now it's like twenty nine thousand. So 
um, yeah, this is a, a just a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> Another comment there or question from Kat. Yes, there is a recording and our meetup recordings are generally published to YouTube. So we're a little bit behind on, I think the previous month's one and that's gonna be published on Monday. So hopefully this one will be on YouTube as well. And I'll share our website link at the end of the meetup. Um, if anybody wants to go and uh, just find all the links to all the places. Uh, Faith has a question for Matt and John. Why Cosmos DB instead of the other alternatives? Um, Go for it, John. <laughs> well, I guess the biggest thing for us, obviously, Frere is part of Xbox and Microsoft, obviously, we, yeah, we're sort of tied to Azure anyway. Uh, and basically, as of the available Azure offerings, you know, Cosmos is the one that's far, so by far the best fit. So we're already using Redis. I mean, we could have picked other offerings and stood up VMs and, and ran them ourselves manually and maintained the infrastructure and then done all the deal with all the backups and so forth ourselves. But um, we kind of try to lean on the kind of the managed offerings that Azure offers us as much as we can. Yeah, because we basically we want to write games and game services and kind of leave the infrastructure and the kind of that stuff to the I'd say to the experts, but to, to somebody else. Um, so that's kind of why we do that. Um, and like I say, uh, I think that kind of leads on to the next kind of question, really. Yeah. Why do you ever, would you ever consider developing the key key value DB in house and housing it in house, housing it in house? Um, I think as much as I'd love the challenge of doing that, pretty much for the, the same reasons as why we picked Cosmos, we would not. And James's question. Oh, I can't scroll anymore. <laughs> so, so Rob, um, uh, one of the things I was going to ask is like, I'm I'm interested if anyone else has any any kind of why didn't you do it this way? So, like, is there a particular approach that um, that you would have tried? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly answer Rob's question. Well, yeah, we did look at some other approaches. We probably might have worth mentioning, but hey, that's what questions are for, right? Um, this is not the first time we've tried to do this migration, and we have tried another approach previously that um, we kind of abandoned. Um, we tried but, to but kind to, of... to be clear, yeah. I wasn't working here then, so... Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, but, sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I got Matt's big brains on it back then. Um, yeah, we, we kind of looked at, for a while, doing a, kind of like a online migration and kind of doing it lazily. So we kind of have uh, the service able to talk to to Redis and talk to a new Cosmos database side by side and kind of like, you know, hey, the first time you log in, you don't exist in Cosmos, let's go and then go to, to, to the Redis and kind of pull, pull you over. Um, but the problem with that is, again, because we have lots of people who just, just don't play regularly or some might have churned out or might not come back. Um, we kind of end this kind of the kind of worst of both worlds, right, whereby we were still paying for Redis because we still all players in there. We might come back later and paying for Cosmos, um, but we just obviously solved the time problem because we didn't have to sort of lift and shift in one go. Um, but that meant, yeah, we still had the worst and the best of both worlds at the same time. So that's kind of one reason we sort of revisited. And thought, like, okay, we need to kind of be able to put a, 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 a line in the sand and say after this date there will be no more Redis. Um, I'd certainly love to know what people would do better because hey we've not done this yet right so yeah if you guys have got better ideas <laughs> now's the time and uh i can tell matt his idea was rubbish and we'll go do something else <laughs> um okay so mg ferrera asked how does the game connect to the db directly i have questions regarding security and performance maybe just explain a bit how that connection and update happens uh so there's there's a few ones, but basically no, the the game is never connecting directly to a database ever. Um, there's some things where the game will call out to our APIs or our microservices, and it'll say, "Hey, I want to do this, or I need this information." But in a lot of cases, you would not be changing data and stuff based on what the client is, is telling you. Um, there's a lot of trust things there. 
and you can essentially never trust the clients. So in most cases, uh, yeah, in most cases, it'll be the server writing to our services in some way or another directly via REST call or over like a message bus sy system. Um, we use RabbitMQ, but yeah, I, I think that answers your question. John, do you have anything to? Yeah, I think in nutshells, like, that's, that's kind of thing. We, we never trust the game client people's machine. The client's always talking to the game server. The game server is obviously hosted in our infrastructure. We Therefore, we trust our server. We own it. It runs in our infrastructure. And the server kind of has a higher level of privilege to send events and saying the player did this or the player wants to change this state about themselves. So, yeah, is that kind of trust about it? We trust the server, not the client. And, and it's important to know that uh, we host the servers, like not ourselves, but it's not a peer to peer game. So, uh, so in Azure, we've got, you know, thousands of servers and that's why we can, we can trust them. These aren't sitting on people's computers. And yes, Kat, the client is never right. <laughs> Smiley face <laughs> from Kat, thank you. Uh, is REST expensive? Uh, is this also, that is expensive also for performance. Ever thought of something else? Uh, yeah, this kind of like when we do kind of have this kind of hybrid model, like you, you're right, you know, making a round trip with a REST call, you know, literally request response, serialized, deserialized can be um, expensive. So we do kind of have this hybrid model. So um, the, the, the game server still uses JSON and we do constantly look at the performance of that. And I think one of the teams in the engine right now is looking at writing as a, a faster JSON serializer. Um, but we kind of use this hybrid approach. So if an event is kind of like a fire and forget and we don't, the client or the, sorry, the server doesn't need an immediate response, then we'll just send it over the message bus, just enqueue it and let it go, let it go. We only use kind of the rest whereby the, 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 the server needs an immediate acknowledgement that something has happened. Um, so maybe this is a purchase, right? I've purchased something, I need an immediate response to say the purchase was successful versus you know, firing the statistic to say, I killed a skeleton, which we sent via a message queue. Um, yeah, look at gRPC. Yeah, that's all viable alternatives. Um, the game, we're kind of leveraging some of the stuff because the game's based on real engines. So there's already kind of like a, a lot of stuff already in there. You know, JSON serialization is native to that and integrates with the, the game's reflection system. So it's kind of easy to integrate. But um, the, the nice thing is this is an ongoing game. We're patching and changing things regularly. Like if that ever becomes a problem for performance, we will change it. And you know, we're open to looking at different tech. So yeah, if that ever a problem, we would change it for sure. I hope that answers the question, sorry. <laughs> Shadow if not. I wanted to make a comment earlier as I heard um, you both speak about players. And earlier when I was introducing your talk, I talked about users. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> well, I guess it depends how much they're enjoying it. <laughs> I remember watching a talk um, sometime last year, I think just before, COVID hit us and we could actually still have in-person conferences. Um, and the person said there's only one other industry that talks about users and we really should stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like to think of players? players. How many players do you have on um, Sea of Thieves? Over 20 million. I think you probably did say that, but I, I yeah. must have missed it with all the, you know, 72 <laughs> hours and two hours math. It's got a bit much for me. Yeah, I'll put a picture. Yeah, there we go. Oh, you probably can barely read that. 20 million players. Yeah, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Well done, uh, you guys. I mean, yeah. Who would have thought a game where you can play socially with your friends would be so successful? In a pirate setting, nonetheless, you know. <laughs> you can eat bananas with the peels on. It's 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 quite a revolutionary, really. For well, fifteen dollars, sounds good. Well, free on Game Pass. Hey, there you go. 
Yeah. And Game Pass is about 10 rand for the first month, I think. Okay, this is not an advert. <laughs> <laughs> like very cheap entertainment for most of us who are staying home and staying safe. Um, I'm not seeing too much new activity on the chat there. So um, John and Matt, we've got two licenses for JetBrains uh, to give away. So you can decide if you want to ask a question to see if people have been paying more attention than me. And the, the person who answers the fastest can win, or you can give it away to someone who asks you a creative question. Uh, up to you. Uh, yeah, I've I've got a question. Um, that, what I guess the first person that answers, which is better, Azure or AWS? I feel like that's targeted as our intellect challenge. Oh, wow. I feel like. I feel like Kat topped that before. I yeah, that, I, I think like, so. That was that was definitely preempted. Um, some smart okay. there. Well, there you go, Kat. Kat winning the prize. Ryan, yeah. I'm I, I did feel awkward when we saw James was talking about migrating from Azure to ECS earlier. <laughs> Well done, Kat. You can drop me a direct message on Zoom and we will send your prize over. So Matt's given away one license. John, how would you like to give away the next one? Oh, I don't know. I can't handle the pressure. Like everyone's <laughs> been so great and the, the questions have been so good. Oh, how do I want to get away? Take a dramatic sip of water, Matt. Hmm. I don't know. I think because I'm, yeah, Matt's manager, I'm just going to use the power of delegation here and delegate to Matt again. Then if we're, if I'm absolved of all responsibility. <laughs> this is basically my day today. Um, okay. Well, MG Ferreira had a very fair question about rest and performance. So I'm glad you chose that. That was kind of, I was hoping to go there. <laughs> Very good. Okay, MG and Kat, you are both winners. So you can send me a message through email addresses so we can get those prizes to you. Um, and I'm just going to paste something I typed earlier. A uh, link to our website. Um, thank you. Shout out to Intellect, who's been sponsoring the user group for a number of years now. Uh, we're very lucky to have such great support from you. And many of our organizers are also Intellect uh, fans and employees. So it's wonderful uh, to be part of this community with you and your support always. Matt and John, I don't know what time it is in the UK, but I'm sure you're hungry. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks to all our attendees this evening. You've been a fabulous audience. And to uh, the developer user group co-organizers that made this Zoom experience so much more relaxing for me, thank you. And see you again on the third Wednesday of next month, which I don't know what date that is. Let me tell you. Should be the 19th. 19th. Perfect. 19th of May. You'll see us again. I can't believe we're already in May. Thank you very much, everybody, and good night.